thank you, Brenda, so much. We think it's important to start our programs with singing because it was the songs that provided spiritual uplift for our people and the songs that transferred messages to them. And it was the songs that helped us to remember our values through some pretty horrific times. That is why we why we sing. I want to thank Fred Atkins and the city of Sarasota and also Newtown residents for uh, jump-starting this Newtown Alive project. Um, when Fred was elected to the city commission, he went out into the community to ask what residents thought would be his priorities, should be. And the residents said, preserve our history because they had looked to Overtown, where they first developed a community, and they saw what had happened to it, that it was uh, disappearing. And so that's why the Newtown Alive uh, project started. And there are some recurring themes that are um, occurring throughout these stories that um, our team found. Now, this started out as a research report, you've got to know. You know, the city asked us for some specific things, and that was a research report, some oral history interviews, an inventory of historic structures, and uh, they wanted a website and mobile app. We leveraged, we leveraged that $50,000 to the hilt, and then that next $155,000, we leveraged as well. But, Throughout these oral history interviews, there were recurring themes. And one was how young people really shook up this town and turned the tables on convention. And this project is causing Sarasota and this region to take another look at the Newtown community through the powerful lens of its history. One young person that helped to shake up this community <laughs> is the beautiful and the charming Mrs. Odessa Butler. I have had the joy of spending time with her, and actually this this project is transformative, believe me. As she shares her story, please feel free to pick up things that you're going to need for the rest of your life. And by all means, share them with your grandkids. We do trolley tours. And the last thing that we say to our guests is share this story, please. Welcome, Pastor. Is that the pastor of Greater Hearst Chapel AME Church? Yes. Stand and be recognized, Pastor. is uh, the pastor of uh, Mrs. Butler. And uh, Greater Hearst Chapel members are in the house. Amen. Stand and be recognized, Greater Hearst, if you want to. All right, Greater Hearst. It's a historic church where many civil rights meetings were held to shake up this town. But Mrs. Butler, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your background and, and how your family happened to arrive here in Sarasota. What drew you here? My father and mother. I was 10 years old when we moved to Sarasota uh, from Pensacola, Florida. And of course, we were not in the city of Pensacola, but a little town north of Pensacola called Antomac. And my mother and father were battling a divorce, and her brother, Johnny Brooks, lived here and said, come to Sarasota with your children so that uh, you can make a life for yourself and for them. So that's how we originally got into Sarasota, and that was back in the year of 1952. I was 10 years old when my brother was four. Uh, after that, uh, I remembered it was the housing project 
the ones that are on Orange Avenue, and then the second set was built, which we call the New Projects. And at that time, they were just being completed, and we were able to go into the second unit, which was 1714 Carver Court. And I will remember that number the rest of my life, because most of my childhood was from that particular area. Before you start talking about life um, at Carver Court, describe to us um, your mother, because she played a key, um, she was a key influencer in your life. My mother was a, a very brave woman, first of all, very outspoken woman, uh, was president of the local NAACP um, for more than three or four years. Uh, didn't mind trying to get people to understand that there was, we could be different, we could live differently. We just had to work for it. And we got a lot of pushbacks. We got a lot of things that were not nice to us. But she was a fighter. And most of the people that knew her realized that she didn't back down. She was heavy in stature, and she would not back down. She took no for an answer. Uh, one of the things that she also started was the housing uh, apartments. There were problems. And I, I wanted to remember to tell you this today that, you know, we think that solar energy is new. It is not. <laughs> because number one, when we moved into the housing project, at 1714, we had solar heating out for our water. God forbid a rain for three or four days. Do you understand where I'm coming from? <laughs> it meant putting the pots on the stove in order to get some hot water. But we are very, I mean, it was a trying time. And it was a number of years after that before there was money available to take all those units out. So we are very grateful that now they don't have to worry about it. And the other thing, that there was no air conditioning. We had to use the windows and the doors. <laughs> and some days it was very, very hot. But the neighborhood was quite interesting because as people began to move in, we became bonded, we became bonded to each other. And we depended on each other for uh, what we needed. If we needed a babysitter, whoever was home and not working, that's where you went. And, and they said, okay, bring them over. Or if you're gonna be out, of, out on the beach where my mother worked a lot of the times, she'd have the neighbor look out for my kids. And I remember we were one of the first families to even get a telephone. And of course, there were, I think, eight people on that one particular line. Party lines. And that was a party line. Uh, I remember the little black and white television. We were one of the first to have that. And uh, we would have all our neighborhood friends come in and watch cartoons. And this is how my growing up in that particular area, and I was able to develop from that because I saw a need for people. And today, I still see that need Everybody is not on the same level. And what we need to do is to just reach down and say, how are you today? Uh, have a good day. And I think it makes people feel much, much better. All right. You said um, your mother was a strong woman and she didn't take no for an answer. But she, um, allowed you to have a lot of responsibility. You were telling me how you would take the bus shopping. Describe that scenario. Well, we had no car. And <laughs> interestingly enough, they did have bus service to Newtown. And the bus fare at that time was 10 cents. 
10 cents to go downtown. And there was a grocery store, a large grocery store. We had a couple of here in Newtown. And we also had the uh, drugstore here in Newtown. But to buy your major grocery items, you went to the store across uh, on 6th Street, 3rd Street, I think it was, uh, Margaret Ann. So I would take the bus, and I had the responsibility of the household because my mother was working. She was a very hard-working woman. I would take the bus to the grocery store, do the shopping, and there were several uh, black cab companies. Um, Wayne Thomas's dad had a cab. Uh, Mr. Jones, the Joneses, had a cab. So there was always cabs to bring us home. And that fee was 25 cents. Wouldn't that be nice if we could do that today? <laughs> Isaac Cooper, I remember. Yes, that. Mr. Cooper. Yeah. Somebody as well. Yes. Um, Overtown. Yes. What did you see in Overtown when you went shopping? Uh, it was basically for the groceries. But then if we went downtown, and the other thing, the theater. It was a black theater. Only one black theater in the whole city was on 6th Street, and it was called the Ace Theater. And we were allowed to go there. Uh, we also had uh, Payne Chapel Amy Church in the same neighborhood. Um, the other thing is that uh, we weren't always welcome in the immediate downtown area. And I'm talking about Five Points, the Lincoln's Drug Store, and the uh, uh, Five and Dime, which was uh, the, uh, there was a Crest downtown, and the other one was Crest and Lincoln, Woolworth. Woolworth. Woolworths had a lunch counter, and also downtown at the Lincolns had a lunching counter. Uh, we were not allowed to sit or to go in and eat at those particular counters. But you were allowed to buy drugs, medication. Yes. But not have not lunch. Have lunch. And the other thing, if we wanted to get a sandwich or a drink, we had to go to the back door, and they would bring it to us. Someone would bring it and pass it to us. Um, and the same thing was with, with the drugstore. And also, we uh, began to feel that we were not really wanted. I was told when I first came, and my mother said, make sure you're dressed properly when you go downtown. And I wanted to know why. She told me, she said, because they don't like black women wearing shorts in the downtown area. Well, I didn't quite understand that. The other thing I must tell you is there were many times that when we got on the city bus, the bus driver would say, keep straight to the back. <laughs> keep straight to the back. I didn't quite get that either, because there was nobody sitting in the front. But you know, I went halfway. I, I, I was a little dairy. Just like your mom. Just like your mom. I was a little dairy. I would never go all the way to the back. And then I do remember that um, things were beginning to get a little better. But it was not because we did not fight for it. There were many nights, days and nights, that I can remember my mother with a lot of other ministers and members of the black community meeting at our home. She was a single woman, so of course, she only had the two children. And they would meet there with her. They felt comfortable coming to the projects. And they met, and they strategized many of the things that are taking place today. Um, the boycotts, 
the sit-in demonstrations at the counters, the beach demonstrations, and even after all that was in place, then we started having problems with the housing authority. Mrs. Butler, was your mom the president of the NAACP my at that mother, time? My mother was the president of the NAACP at that particular time, yes. When we had the uh, beach demonstration. I want to ask you this too. How, about how old were you when the meetings would be held at your home? Because if you were anything like <laughs> me and my cousins, we'd be in the back listening to the adults having adult conversations. Yes, I went to the refrigerator a lot. <laughs> what did you hear? I mean, did it make any sense? A lot of it didn't make any sense, but I knew that they were planning and they were calling names like Jesse Jackson and, and a Dr. King and they were talking about the, the strategies that they had set in place for these things to come about. Uh, I think my mother had a hotline with Jesse Jackson and, and Dr. King, and there were several others that she uh, would always communicate with. Mm -hmm. And this is where she got some of her, her ideas about how to handle. It was one thing that I do remember she always told us, that they are going to taunt you, they're going to say things to upset you and cause you to get out of control. She said, but the one thing that I do want all of us to do is to be in control of yourself. And I remember that to this day. And I still try to be in control, not that I'm always in control. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do try. I'm in control. Most times I'm in control. There was, um, before I get to that day, that, um, threatened your crown. This is a former Miss Booker High School, everybody. Yeah. Um, the civil rights meetings were happening at your home, but on Friday and Saturday night, yes. there were some other things going on at yes. the home. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, my mother, she worked days, day work, <coughs> cleaning homes, and if there was somebody in the neighborhood wanting to uh, do a party that knew the people that she worked for, she would leave there and go and do parties. It was very difficult because she was now a single mother with two children that she had to support. Of course, she loved playing cards and they formed what they called their little card parties. Well, actually, it really was gambling. I found out later, this is what they did. The top, they would put the money on the table, and every fourth game, the house lady or house man, whoever home we were in, would get that prop. And I have known the times from Friday night to early Sunday morning because she told them, you all got to get out of here because I got to go to church. <laughs> I would go to the bank on Monday with somewhere five, six, seven hundred dollars. So they had played cards from Friday afternoon, Saturday, Saturday night, and until early Sunday morning. But that was the way that she made things better for us a way of making ends meet. A way of making ends meet. Things were going up, you know. In the beginning, we didn't have to pay water bill, light beer, and all that. As times got better, then all these things, we had to pay phone bill. These are things. Mm -hmm. And insurances, and all of this stuff. And then support her two children with food and clothing. So now I, I don't see it as a bad thing because I feel that I'm in a better position now because I knew that it was a struggle for her to provide for us. How can you pay all of that on a, a domestic worker's um, salary? My grandfather um, cut lawns uh, on 
Siesta Key and Longboat Key, and he had men working for him, but it was interesting through these oral history interviews, listening to the ways in which our people um, took care of their families. Now, there was a point, and we're gonna go back to that, uh, that card game, because I want people to understand the word bolia. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but we're talking about making money. You, you went to the doctor's office, your mom did, and you know the story that I'm leading you to. Yes. Um, I had to do most of the cleaning and whatever we had to eat during the day. My mother was a very good cook, and she loved her cooking better than she loved mine. So <laughs> most days she would do uh, cook the evening meal when she was home. Um, there was some grease in a, in a skillet left on the stove, and I was clearing it out to clean the dishes. And I dropped the pan tilted, and I burned my hand. And of course, I had to go to uh, the doctor. And I was still young enough that I could see the pediatrician, Dr. Norman Goldstein. I will never forget him. He took care of the burn that I had, which you can still see some of the scars from that burn, uh, we couldn't pay him. And he told my mother, he said, it's okay. He said, we'll just take care of it now. And then I remembered after I got better, he called one day and said, would you come and babysit my kids on Saturday? And I thought, wow, I get to go to the doctor's home and take care of his children? And that was exciting for me. And I, I did that for several years. And, uh, he, but he was very, very kind about writing the bill off because he knew that we did not have insurance or money. Mm -hmm. There was another um, woman that you spoke about that your mom worked for. Uh, was this, was it the model? that yes. took you to Hobnob. Hobnob on 301 is a community institution. <laughs> but there was a time that African Americans could not enjoy hamburgers and shakes at the Hobnob. Yes, yes, my mother worked for this lady and she made it her business. Uh, she would make appointments uh, with my mom and say that uh, Odessa is, is such a beautiful girl uh, she was a professional model. She said, and I want to just spend some time with her. And she would come on Saturday morning, and she would uh, stand and teach me how to stand properly, how to walk. And after that, she had a convertible, and she was very proud of that, and I was too. She would take us to the hobnob and we would sit in the car and she would go up and order us lunch. And I always remember her for that, uh, wanting to help. And that was her way of helping my mother and myself. Take us to uh, the sit-in at that lick that day from how it all, how you happened to be at the city. I had a, a doctor's appointment that morning. I, I, I think it was a dental appointment or an eye appointment. Um, took the bus to the appointment. And when I left home that morning, my mother said to me, she says, well, we're going to be down at the, at Five Points. She didn't say the drugstore. She said, at Five Points. And when you come back, because that was where you transferred from one bus to the other one. Uh, she said, uh, we probably will be at the drugstore and we're going to be doing a sit-in demonstration. I said, okay, if I get back in time. Well, I did. It was close to noon. And of course, I took advantage of that because I knew she was going to write me an excuse the next day because of the appointment that I had had the day before. So I just felt like that 
I didn't have to go to school that day. <laughs> so uh, what I did was I stopped and went in, and there were six or eight seats taken of the young men that were doing the sit-in. My mother was there. Uh, Mr. Edgar Gibbons, Burt Gibbons, as he's known, he was there. Uh, there were several ministers that were sort of in the background, but they were there for support. I went in and I sat at the counter, and nobody would come and ask us if we wanted anything, because they were not allowed to. They were told that we could not be served. And we were told that we would not be served. So I sat very close to my mother because I needed that. I didn't know what was really going on or what would happen. Of course, there were men coming in to buy things and they, said, they would say to us, why are you here? Go back where you came from. And when I heard our president say that yeah. a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. it really brought back that time to me that I don't belong. Well, we sat there for at least 45 minutes, and then there would be one in the crowd that would uh, give the signal that we all would get up and walk out. In the meantime, we were being taunted by people that were coming in. And they were saying things. They were calling us names. And they were calling us the N-word and told us to go back where we came from. Were you afraid at all? I know your mom was there. <laughs> Well, I think I just kind of leaned on her strength. I didn't know what to expect, but I knew that if anybody was going to be protected, it was going to be me. <laughs> so I tried to stay very close to her. And my mother always had these young men who believed in uh, boxing and um, exercising and muscular young men. And so they were. They were there. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that she always said was, don't say anything. Just be quiet. And that was one of the things that Dr. King always said to his, his people was, there is a spokesman and everybody else listen. And that way you don't incite people to get angry and then they don't know what to do or what to say. So we're going to go back to that social life a little bit, and we're going to go to the beach weigh-ins afterwards. But what is Bonita? I would hear the adults <laughs> talking about it and whispering about it in, in our home. but. I never could piece it together what they were talking about. It was difficult to piece together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what it was that you would bet on numbers. And from what I remember, I was told that these numbers came from Cuba. Mm -hmm. And it was done apparently by radio or by air in some means. Uh, and people would bet. And if they had that number, then they would get paid. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, my mother wasn't into that. She left her card playing. <laughs> <laughs> this was one of those ways that, um, that, that uh, way our community it. survived. Yes. There were other cottage industries that were um, set up in, uh, in the Newtown community. But yes. you, you participated in that sit-in and you were in high school. Yes. You had been crowned. Yes. But the principal found out. Yes. <laughs> and you almost lost that crown. Yes. It's like, <laughs> well, the day that I, I stopped, 
I knew that I had an excuse, so it didn't bother me. Mom was going to write a letter and say she needed to be excused because of the doctor's appointment. But um, by the time we got back to our home in the evening, some of the classmates were saying that Mr. Rogers said that he was going to take your crown and you could not represent the school as Miss Booker High. And of course, I didn't know what to say or what to do because, you know, I didn't go back to school. I was at the sit-in administration with my mom. So of course, my mother, she sat and she thought about it. And I said, well, mom, he didn't give me this crown. I was voted on. And at that particular time, that's how you got to be queen. The body voted on the people that were running to be queen for the school. And she said, don't worry about it. Uh, I will take you to school in the morning. So she did. I was not, we went into the office and he was there. He was Mr. Rogers. The Nolan principal. Rogers. Yes. And my mother said that she wanted to speak with him. And the secretary said, just a minute. Well, she went in and apparently asked him if he would see her. And of course, with his heavy voice, yes, <laughs> bring her on in. <laughs> so she went in, but I was not allowed to go into that meeting. And I sat in the office. In a few minutes, the secretary came out and said to me, go to your class. Well, it was not until after school that I realized what was said. And my mother told me, she said, I asked him how you got the crown. And he explained that I was voted by the school. And she said, if that's the case, then you can't take it from her. And that's the kind of woman she was. I love your mom. <laughs> I really, really do. And I see, I see Maxine Mays in you, Mrs. Butler. Yes, I do. Yes. Um, Roland Rogers, uh, if you can imagine, Bald, wingtip, yes. um, shoes, always dressed immaculately yes. in all of the photographs that, uh, that I've seen of him. And when he spoke, yes. it was so deep. You must have been uh, a part of this class that had Roland Rogers. <laughs> Ladies, yes? I remember it. <laughs> okay. Um, The weigh-ins, because that was the weigh-ins to integrate Sarasota beaches were a key part of African American history here in um, Sarasota. Yes. Mrs. Mary Emma Jones um, marched her hips up to uh, the Sarasota County Commission meeting in 1954, and she asked commissioners to designate a colored beach because she was tired of seeing black children um, swimming in, in swimming holes that filled up with water after a big rainstorm in our community. And then there was these uh, train cars in the back of uh, Galilee Cemetery. They would also fill up with water and students would swim in these swimming cars, and she was a community leader, a feisty lady, just yes. like Mrs. Maxine Mage, and she said, you know, enough is enough. We need some access to the beach. I mean, all this water? Yes. Well, the county commission blew her off when she went, and Neil Humphrey yes. got wind of, you know, what was going on, and he had a, uh, something about, Mr. Humphrey and the, the uh, pharmacy that he had on 27th Street that became Dr. Kingway. Yes. 
uh, Mr. Neil Lumphrey, and he also was uh, at one time president of the NAACP. He and my mother were very, very close together, along with Ed James, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jetson Grimes, uh, Wade Harvey. Uh, these are some of the young men that were, we, she called them her boys. They were very respectful of her. And of course, uh, at the time that um, we were deciding, or they were deciding, um, a beach demonstration was because the only time we could, the only place we could go to the beach would be at Venice. And many of us did not have cars or transportation. So uh, that became a project of the NAACP as well to form a caravan and do a weigh-in at Lido Beach. Uh, that took a little bit longer to get that done because there were a lot of uh, things that had to be done to be taken care of and getting people into understanding that this is very serious. This is what we have to do to make things better for our children. And of course, what we did was uh, right on Orange Avenue the day that they had decided that it was going to be, and these things were done on Sunday after church. Okay. Why was that? Because everybody went to church on Sunday morning. Okay, and you could get a, a large participation after church. Yes. Okay. Many more people would be available after church. Uh, they We gathered at and it's 1912, I remember that name sometime this morning before Don, uh, Orange Avenue. You know, those of you who are not familiar, Orange Avenue was all brick at one time. What do you From, mean, all brick? Yes, there was no pavement. It was brick. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, really hard to ride your bicycle on him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, came the pavement. But that was where uh, the cars would line up, those who had cars. And, and we weren't, they weren't selfish about who got in your car to go to the beach. I remember the week before my mother I kept talking about the sheriff. And one night it was a discussion about how are we going to do this because we want to stay within the reins of the law. Uh, they decided that they were going to motorcade, and they went as far as saying how far each car had to stay behind the other one, and make sure that you didn't do anything out of the way so that you could get pulled over and charged with an infraction. Uh, it came up that we needed uh, police protection. And a lot of people didn't understand that, well, they're probably going to be there anyway. Well, my mother said, I will go see Ross Boyer, who was at that time the sheriff. And she did. He told her, he says, I can't make any promises. And that he left it at that. And that was what my mother told the other members of the committee that was working on getting this all set up. And lo and behold, the day of this, the uh, weigh-in, when the cars were lining up, we saw all these police cars coming and going from different directions. And when we were ready to leave, and I'm not sure exactly which direction, I know we went south on Orange, mm -hmm. but not exactly sure where the touring point was to go to Lido. Wade Harvin, who uh, passed away, I believe it was this year. Yes. He took me through the exact route. Yes. So he said that a group would start at Neil Humphreys um, pharmacy, drugstore, 
right there at the corner of Osprey and Dr. King Way. Right. They would pile into cars and then drive west on to uh, M -L M -O K to Orange, make that left and yes. head south on Orange, pick up more near that flagpole. Right. Mm -hmm. And our trolley tour takes this, um, take, takes this route, pick up more at the flagpole and then keep going to where you know as Boulevard of the Arts, yes. and then would head west, would pass Leonard Reed's house because yes. Wade said that Leonard Reed had a, a, a parrot. <laughs> he remembers a parrot, and when they would pass, the parrot would say something. I have, um, I have uh, Wade recorded, so I've got to go back and hear what that parrot would say. Anyway, they would get to Tamiami Trail and then make that left heading south again, and then go on across uh, Ringling Bridge. Yes. Now, Prevell Barber I interviewed, and she said that she was in that first caravan. So I don't think that they had uh, police escorts at that time. Um, and she said that she was afraid. I did ask her, like, Mrs. Barber, and, and if you go on our website, you'll see um, photographs of some of the people that were interviewed. I said, you gotta tell me what it was like. <laughs> and she said, you know, I was afraid, yes. Yes. but I had to gather up the strength to do it anyway and push past my fear because she said, I said to myself, God made this water and everybody should be able to enjoy this water. It's not for any one person or any group of people. We have to go to pushing past that fear. Yes. She said Elise Suarez was also yes. in that car for that first caravan. You know, I will never be the same when I go back to Lido Beach. And every time I visit Lido Beach, there is a marker there. Yes. I don't know yes. if, uh, if you've seen it, but a marker, but Go ahead and, um, and, and pick up uh, your story. Well, as we began to move, the police were stationed at different points on the way out to the beach. And I remember just as we were getting ready to cross the bridge, there was a motorcycle policeman. And he had the lights on, and he led us directly to the beach. And of course, we all got out, and I don't even remember what I had on. I'm sure it wasn't a bathing suit, but we weren't swimming. We just wanted to walk into the water and, and feel the feeling of being able to have the freedom to go. And uh, everybody was very orderly. Uh, there again, we were told to go home or go back where you came from, and that the beach was not for us. But we were not allowed to say anything. We had to be really quiet, and I tell you, that was a tough time. It's hard for you, wasn't it? It was very difficult, even for my mother. Mm -hmm. But she had said, do not intimidate them by responding to their ignorance. And we, we felt that. We had to do that in order that the message really got heard. And that was part of it. And each weekend, this went on for most of the summer. And now, we can go to the beach. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We can go to the beach. And let me tell you the time periods of these weigh-ins. Like I said, Mary Emma Jones um, marched herself up to the county commission in 1954. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964. So that was generations of activists yes. like Mrs. Butler who Sunday after church would go and do these weigh-ins. That's why I'm so grateful 
for the work that, that you've done in these activists. And as I've said, this work is, uh, is life changing. Because of her work and the other activists, I teamed up with Visit Sarasota and we submitted an application to get our wave-ins listed on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. And indeed, we announced that on January 21st of this year, that the work that these activists did are now listed on that U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Right, right. right up there with the Edmund Pettus Bridge and Dr. King's um, Memorial in Atlanta. There is Sarasota's Wade in. Yeah. 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 We're so proud. We have a few more minutes. You know, as you can tell, I can sit and listen to Mrs. Butler tell her stories all day, and I've done that at yours. And we went, I went to her home and we talked some more. But I'm going to uh, allow you to ask some questions now, if, um, if you will, with 10 minutes left. About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. Do, would you have any questions? I have uh, more if, if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Will we pass the mic? Do we have a mic being passed? Or uh, I'll repeat the question if I hear it. OK. Anybody? Yes, I hear. I see a hand. I was just going to ask, um, what is the one thing that you would tell young people today about what is, how to get engaged what is the one thing, Mrs. Butler, that you would tell young people about how to get engaged and involved? I think that's a very good question. Uh, I struggle daily. We have dropped the ball. We have not taught our children about our history. And one of the things that I was thinking of last night is we wait too late. We need to start teaching them. They think that Martin Luther King's day is because they don't have to go to school. There's parades and all this fancy stuff. That that's what it's about. But they need to know our history from the slavery time, our parents and our grandparents coming to this country and the way they were treated. Our children need to know that. And many of them, even now, have no idea what it took to be able to get on the bus and not have to go to the back, or to go to a lunch counter and sit down and have a meal and not have people say, you're not wanted, or go back home where you came from. They don't know. So if at all possible, we need to incorporate this in our teaching, that they be taught where we came from. It was a struggle, and it is still a struggle. Amen. There are still places that we're not wanted. Now, we can go there, but not every place are we really wanted. And I'll say this, too, um, in working on this project, I think often um, when I hear people like you speak, uh, Reverend Dupree and others, what a confident, a more confident little girl I would have been um, had I heard these stories uh, coming up. Now, I was reared in a, in a great family who taught confidence and so forth, but still, but still, we live in, in Sarasota, Florida. The, African-American community here is very, very small. And so, you know, even when I was in elementary school and, and high school, outside of our community, you felt a little different. Inside our community, man, we were taught you can do anything you want. You can be anybody you want or whatnot. But outside, there was a difference. So that's why Newtown Alive, I feel, is really, really important. And so that follow-up uh, to your question is, we are talking with the school district now about how to interject this history into the social studies curriculum in our schools. And we're going to start 
by honoring an educator, Mrs. Dorothy Smith. Yes, ma'am. Uh, to feed off of you, this is not a question, but Booker High School this year has a class of African American history. And I am in the process now of doing the timeline for the teacher. So it is taking place. Praise Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. Is there another question? Um, I'm yes. I'm curious, are these three presentations going to be presented in the schools? Are these three presentations going to be presented in the schools? Um, that's in New York a lot. <laughs> Laura. <laughs> Laura says that uh, we will work on that. I tell you what is happening. My team, the New Channel Live team, we're getting invitations from throughout uh, the community to come and do talks and to show our, uh, our video, um, and we're doing that. And people are jumping on our trolley tours. Um, I book through groups, and we roll around Newtown and Overtown seeing some of the places that Mrs. Butler talk about. Um, we'll show you where Mr. Humphrey's gross, uh, his pharmacy is and, and that flagpole at um, public housing, the projects. Now those projects are going to be all torn down and assumed, but we're going to have some sort of um, commemoration of the people and a celebration of the people like Mrs. Maxine Mays' family and others who lived there before they are torn down and um, uh, housing for seniors is built. Yes, sir. Well, or, just, yes, ma'am? I wanted to make a comment about the North, uh, the North Sarasota County Library and, and how that could go out. So, Odessa, you might talk about that. I think it's very important. Uh, she's here. Where's Mrs. Yes. Betty Johnson? Oh, yes. Yay! Yes. Miss Betty Johnson. Thank you. Well, the North Sarasota Library is now called the Betty G. Johnson North Sarasota Library. Go ahead. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm really proud. We were classmates. <laughs> and, and I'm really very proud. She also has written a book that's available for purchase. What's the name? The Village is... The Village as I Knew It is No More. Yes. And uh, a little bit about Mrs. Johnson's story. We all, as little kids, remember uh, the bookmobile coming through Newtown. There were a couple of stops, five stops, and she would let the children come and pick out books, check out books. But Mrs. Johnson told me when Mary Emma Jones, remember the Mary Emma Jones who, um, who went to the county commission to ask for the beaches to be open? Well, she was also instrumental in getting African Americans hired um, in key places throughout the community. So she um, got a, an African American librarian hired who hired Mrs. Johnson, who did not initially think that she would be a librarian, but she was learning the Dewey Decimal System. Um, and she could not attend college here in Sarasota, they had to go to college in St. Petersburg, Manatee, Memo uh, Manatee um, Community College was not open to African Americans, so they had to go across the bridge to Gibbs, and she learned the Dewey Decimal System and so forth, and so she went for a job, um, the African American um, woman helped her get hired, and she noticed that African-American patrons were not treated so well when they came. They were not welcome. They had, and she herself had to uh, give the librarian uh, some instructions on what sort of book she wanted because she was not allowed to go into the stacks to get the book herself. And so the librarian had to go. And so when she became a librarian, she said, this, this nonsense has to stop. Uh, she wanted to use a bookmobile that was taken out of commission um, that the county library system had used. But they said, nah, I think they gave you a van. And she made a, a bookmobile out of it. And then there was a, a storefront library. 
on MLK, and she just kept pushing and pushing and pushing until we were able to open the North Sarasota Public Library that's named after her, and that was just dedicated <laughs> two weeks ago. I, have, I want to say one other thing about that. Uh, I remember uh, I was doing a study, and I needed a book from the public library. Uh, they would not give blacks uh, cards to take books out. And my mother, again, discussed it with one of the people that she was working for. And she would get the book for me. And, and we couldn't get it. I mean, they wouldn't let us in to even take a book out. So times have changed. It's a new day. And we as black people, the struggle, I'm saying again, is not over. And, I, and one other thing that I remembered, uh, and I was very well an adult at this particular time, I had gone into a store that I did not visit very frequently, and I purchased an item, and I hand the lady my money. Well, when she pulled the change out, she threw it on the counter. And I stood there with my hand out. She said, there's your money. I said, I know. <laughs> I continued to hold my hand. She said, I said, there's your money. And I said, I know. But I gave you my bill. And I expect you to give me my change. And it was the boldness. It was that boldness that I really, really, yes, am uh, empowered by. This has been a great um, event, and I always love to hear from you. We'd like to make a presentation to you, Mrs. Butler, to say thank you so much for opening yourself up to us. <laughs>